All right. See, I didn't even say you can have a seat. You just all kind of, boom. There we go. Awesome. Kids, you can head to your classes. Thank you, teachers, for the work you invest in, uh, in the lives of these kids. So thank you for that. We're uh, continuing our study in the book of Acts. Uh, it's the continuing work of Jesus through the life of his disciples. And we have seen that from the very beginning, the resurrection of Jesus, the of the disciples, his empowering them with the Holy Spirit, the, uh, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the beginning proclamation of the good news of Jesus. Jesus had said that his good news would go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And the disciples, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, had been proclaiming the truth of Jesus' resurrection, and it had impacted Jerusalem. And it began to spread to Judea. Judea. Uh, uh, one of the disciples, name of Stephen, was martyred. And as a result, it spread to Samaria and began to spread outside. But the whole context at this point and to this point had been within the Jewish community. The good news of Jesus had been proclaimed. Now God was beginning something new. And so... If we go back and look when uh, the spreading of the uh, truth of Jesus within, even in Jerusalem, it began with, and Luke is, uh, specifically draws this out, it began with the miracle of healing a lame man outside of the temple. A direct contrast, we talked about it, it was the battle of the two temples, the temple of, uh, existed in Jerusalem and the temple of the Holy Spirit dwelling within the followers of Jesus. And uh, that caused a great deal of conflict, but through that conflict, it magnified the proclamation of Jesus. And that's why it grew in Jerusalem. And it created such a um, distaste from the religious leaders that they brought Stephen before them in a trial, and that's why he was ultimately, um, well, it was ultimately because of their hatred toward Jesus that they killed Stephen, but that spread the good news out. Now, <clears throat> it started with a miracle there, we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, Peter pro uh, performed two more miracles, and, it, and Luke purposely draws attention to that. I've pointed this out to you before, that there are multiple miracles stated in the book of Acts, but not all of them detailed for us. So when Luke takes the time to detail a miracle, he does it to draw our attention to something specific, and the specific thing he wants us to see is that God is starting a new work. He did that with, uh, with the healing of the uh, lame man outside the temple. It was the spreading of the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem, Judea. He then, and then ultimately to Samaria. He, we now are focused back again on two miracles by Peter. And in that, he, uh, a man who had been paralyzed for eight months, he heals. And Tabitha, who had passed away, was brought back to life. And as a result, we are being focused in again, really as, as those who are watching and reading through this uh, and observing what Jesus is doing, it is to draw our attention what's going to happen now. And the happening now began with Peter having a, a vision. Middle of the afternoon, he's hungry and wants a meal, and he goes up on the roof to pray, and while the meal's being prepared, he has a vision uh, of... Uh, a sheet being lowered down with all animals of every kind, clean and unclean by Jewish law. And he hears a voice say to him, kill and eat. And he, oh, I can't do that, Lord. I've never eaten anything that would make me unclean. And three times this is presented to him. And then it's lifted up. And then the Holy Spirit says to him, hey, Peter, there's two guys standing at the gate that want you to go with them. And I want you, don't hesitate. Go with them. Because was not aware that as God was working on him, he was also working on a man named Cornelius who was a Gentile. He was a Roman centurion. He was a man who had a faith in God. That is stated out to us, that he had a faith in God, but it was an uninformed faith. Peter had an informed faith that needed to be expanded. Cornelius had an uninformed faith that needed to be expanded as well. It needed to be informed so that it could grow. God wanted the two of them to come together. So, uh, at the same time, when Peter's having a vision, Cornelius has a vision. And it's in that an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, you need to send to Joppa 
for a man named Simon Peter who's staying with Sam and the t- uh, Tanner, and it is there you need to talk to him and have him come back to you. Here's what's real interesting in this. Neither of them knew why this was important other than God was at work in them. Peter doesn't know why he's not told. He had a vision that becomes central to why, but he was not told, hey, Peter, I need you to go and tell them of the good news of Jesus. Now Peter would have said, but Lord, he's a Gentile. God approached him in another way. Cornelius doesn't know. He just is a God-fearing man who allows his faith in God to influence his actions, and he's known for that. But it's still an uninformed faith. He doesn't know what God has done through Jesus. And so these two men uh, are, are the messengers from Cornelius come in with Peter to talk, and the next day they head out to Cornelius' house, and a few of Peter's fellow believers go with him, and we left off last week. Peter had gone into the house of Cornelius, welcomed there, and in the house is not just uh, Cornelius, but all of his family. They're sitting there, and Peter says, do you realize that it is a, an offense against the law of, of the Jewish law for me to be here in your house? But the point is the contrast there. He didn't stand outside the house and say that. He walked in and said that. And he said, it's, the point is, God has been teaching me something. And so in that process, as he goes in there, he is willing, and I appreciate this, we talked about before, he has a learner's attitude. He's trusting God in faith. God, there's things I don't know. And you seem to be at work. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to trust you in this. So this is where we, we pick up and we left off last week. Now, we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. This is what, what Cornelius says to Peter. What I love about that statement is we're all here. So he's, he's gathered his whole family together. And we're waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. He knows what Peter has to say is a direct message from God. That's faith. That is an expression in the extent of his faith. He has gone, I've been saying this to you, he's gone to the extent of his faith and he's living on the edge of his faith. I believe, I know, God said to call you, he, you're here, he's got a message for me. I'm, I'm ready and I'm listening. I think we could all learn a few things from, from Cornelius, even at this point. He lived a life with an expectancy that God is speaking. Think about that in and of itself. Do you believe that God is speaking today? The same God, same purpose. Is he speaking? See, I think part of the challenge for the church today is we've forgotten that God is speaking. And we spend far too much time speaking and not enough time listening nor expecting for God to speak. And expectancy for God to speak will allow us to respond when he's leading us somewhere. If I don't have that expectancy, God says do something or prompts me to do something, I'm going to hesitate and come up with a thousand reasons not to because my faith doesn't drive my decisions. My faith is secondary or, at best, secondary to my decision-making process. You see how important it is that we become those who expect God to speak? If he is the same God with the same purpose, what's that purpose? To expand the good news of Jesus, to stretch our faith and understanding, to allow us to live in full uh, obedience and response to him, to allow Jesus to become the empowerment and I can become the embodiment of Jesus within my culture. God's still speaking. He's looking for those who are willing to be his mouthpiece and those who are willing to listen to be used by him. Second thing I like about Cornelius is um, I recognize a truth that God has stated before and, and several times in Scripture, and that is that God rewards those who seek him. If you seek me, you will find me if you if you seek me with your whole heart. Cornelius didn't have all the answers but he sought God. You see, sometimes we think we have to come up with the answers to find God. That's not the case. We need to seek God honestly with a sincere heart, seek him, and guess what? He will respond to us. But sometimes our own efforts to answer our own questions gets in the way of hearing God and finding God. We need to learn to live Knowing not only is God speaking, but he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 
This is the best, one of the best examples in Scripture of that truth. A Gentile being brought the gospel of Jesus that until this point, everybody thought it was for the Jews. This is a major, this is a seismic shift in culture. This is a seismic shift within the church. This is a seismic shift of faith. And this is where we need to understand and learn for God, from God, as Jesus still wants to expand his church. He's still at work in the life of his disciples. And there's going to be a third thing here as I look at Cornelius, is do you believe that others can be used by God to inform your, your faith? I, my, my guess is if you think about it a minute, you're probably, okay, yeah, I could see that. If we believe God's still speaking and God is wanting to work through the lives of individuals to proclaim the truth of Jesus, have you limited or stopped your faith at a point where you don't believe that God can use others to help you grow? If that's the case, you don't need the church. That's one of the reasons why the church uh, is struggling today. One of the interesting things that happened coming out of the pandemic, I'm sure we're all aware of this, is that church attendance dropped way down because people got this idea, I don't need to be a church. I can't find that in Scripture, and I can't find it in the book of Acts, and I can't find it in this particular chapter. We need people because God uses others to inform our faith and uses me to impact others' faith. How am I going to be held accountable if there's nobody around me to hold me accountable? How am I going to grow in my understanding of the application of Scripture if no one else is walking with me in the, in the light of Scripture? We need each other. That's why we do life groups here, so we can laugh together, have fun together, but we can also grow in the expectation God is speaking, and he speaks to others as well as he speaks to me. That's what the church is about. That's how we function here. We expect God to speak, but we expect him to also use others to be a part of the, that voice into our lives. So I'll make a plug. If you're not in a life group, get in a life group. Come to events. The reason we have events is not just to eat food, though we love food. It's not just to, to do uh, funny things or laugh, though there's great health in that. But those things help us to become, um, let down our guard with other people so that our faith can be growing together and be, we can be informing and challenging and encouraging each other. That's how a community of faith grows. Put yourself fully into it, but fully in, back to the first one, expecting God to speak to you and inform your faith and grow your faith. And more with Cornelius than you thought was there, isn't there? So Cornelius, to me, is a, is a, a great point of encouragement. So Peter's there in his house. Cornelius is expecting, along with his family, that God's going to speak through Peter, and then let's jump in now to see what takes place. Verse 34. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the, uh, for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, uh, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed uh, preaching his message of uh, Sorry, and you know God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were uh, oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, there's a lot packed in those verses. I'm going to try to break it out real quick because we've got to see what Peter does here. I'll give you an overview so you can, we catch uh, what's going on here. Peter's been invited to this man's house, and this man is a Gentile. But God has brought him there. But Peter, in a very concise, actually very short, it's, go compare it to Acts chapter 2, Peter's first sermon. This is just a quick, hey, I'm going to tell you what's going on. There's a reason why. Because Cornelius is a man who's been seeking God. He has a foundation already. And you could say, well, the Jews had a foundation. The problem was what stood in the way for the Jews was the law. And that was the biggest, one of the biggest struggles for them, and we'll see that going through the book of Acts, to understand how did Jesus uh, fit within the context of the law. Well, he came to fulfill it, he, and, and we've looked at that already. 
And in that process, though, we have Cornelius, a Gentile, who is a man who has demonstrated his faith in God, that there's a God who exists and that God is at work and that God expects obedience and response from my life. So Peter dives right in with him, and he says very clearly, and I want you to catch first thing he says there, very clearly, God, uh, uh, it, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Where is that coming from? It's from the vision that he had just the day before. It's sunk in. Peter now goes, I get what you were asking me to do, God. That's why I'm standing in this, the living room of a Gentile. And I love that he says there, in every nation he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Peter is getting the idea that, there are, that Gentiles can get to God, the God of the Jewish people. But it's still a bit mind-boggling for him. You've got to realize, this is not a simple thing of, oh, I guess I just got to think differently. This is, oh, God is doing something much bigger than I have ever understood. I've been raised up to think that God's salvation, his Messiah, would only come for the Jewish people. And now I'm sitting in a Gentile's house who's uh, been told by God that I will tell him about Jesus. That's pretty cool. And then he says, this is the message, and catch this, of good news, and he puts in a little caveat right there, for the people of Israel. See, he's being honest about how he's understood it. The good news has been for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, but he doesn't stop his conversation at that point. The good news through Jesus, salvation comes through Jesus, that's been the good news to the, to the, uh, to the Jewish people. But Peter goes further. You know, so now he takes it to them. You know what happened throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after John began preaching the message of baptism. So he's going clear back to John the Baptist. And he's saying, you're well aware. So it tells you right there the influence that what happened with Jesus was not just within a Jewish context. It was known throughout a region, an area, a large area. People knew about Jesus. So he's saying to Cornelius, which is the common ground that he's, Peter's building on, you've known these things about Jesus. You know it started with John the Baptist. And it goes on. he goes on in, and into that. He says, uh, you saw what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, um, and then you know that God anointed Jesus. So he goes from John the Baptist to Jesus. And that Jesus was anointed. So these are things they most likely had either witnessed or heard of the miracles of Jesus. They may have even heard his teaching. It was not just Jews that sat under his teaching. There would oftentimes be uh, Gentiles coming to Jerusalem, traveling throughout the same area where Jesus was. They would sit down. They would be hearing, hey, did you hear that, that, that uh, strange dude Jesus out there on the hill? I heard him today. And they talk about it. It was known. And Jesus is, uh, 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 Peter is bringing them back to what they do know about Jesus. And that he was anointed by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he, he went around helping the oppressed. So he really quickly summarizes the whole ministry of Jesus. Why? Because he wanted Cornelius' family to see who Jesus is, not just what he had done. They know about what he had done. They've got to see Jesus. And that's his main point. So then we jump down to verse 39. And we uh, apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. If you go back, I encourage you to go back and read this after we've gone through it today. <clears throat> what Peter is saying is, you've heard of all these things, but now I want to make it personal. We apostles. There are a few of us that know the full extent of who Jesus is and what he actually accomplished. That's what he's stating there in verse 39. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross. So they would have known, Cornelius' family would have known that Jesus was crucified. But God raised him to life on the third day. Now maybe they've heard rumors of that. And so this is where Peter, in stating that we apostles are the ones that were witnesses, let me tell you now what I saw firsthand. We all saw that, the stuff that you're aware of. Now let me tell you what you aren't aware of. And I'm telling you because I was a first-hand witness to this. 
God raised him to, from the, to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So you, do you get what he's done now? Peter has gone, they've never met before. So Peter is building on the context of what these people sitting in that room would have known about Jesus. But now he's pushed it further. Let me tell you from a personal uh, testimony of what I experienced. You knew he died. I know he came back to life. God raised him from the dead. How do I know that? Because I ate a meal with him. That, there's significance in that that we don't understand. In that culture, in that day, to sit and have a meal with somebody was to, take, was to commune with them. It was the heart of life. It was the let's do life together. And Jesus was alive is what Peter was saying. Not some ghost, not some part of our imagination. He was eating what we were eating. We sat around a table. We ate together. Not everybody saw this. We apostles saw this. We experienced it. I took the same bread that Jesus took. And he's making it personal. <clears throat> And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. So he now is making a transition to the theological impact, the spiritual impact of what they were to proclaim. Jesus, because of his resurrection, and I know he was resurrected because I ate with him and saw him, witnessed him alive, he now has authority over the living and the dead. This is what Cornelius and his family do not know. They do not know the authority of Jesus in his victory over the grave. They only know he was crucified, so they think he was a good man, a, a good rabbi, a, a well-known teacher, did miracles, but he died. No, he didn't die, is what Peter's saying to them. In fact, he was brought back to life by his father, and his, in that he became the king over life and death. He's the judge now over everything. And he continues, he is the one all the prophets test about, say, testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Peter now introduces the impact, personal impact, of what Jesus has accomplished. He's laid uh, the foundation of what they know, he's introduced what they didn't know, and he gives it credibility by his own personal testimony. And now he goes, here's the result of what it means for Jesus to be ruler over both life and death, he can offer forgiveness of sins. That's where his authority lies. And in that, you can have a relationship with God. I love that, that verse there. He is the, uh, the one all people testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. It's faith in Jesus. Culturally, too, when it talks about faith in his name, um, there have been movements that have tried to get off that all we need is the name of Jesus. No, we need what that name stands for and what it accomplished. You see, culturally, the name was what... Uh, I'm trying to think how we can even relate this to our culture today because it's not as significant today as it was in their culture. Uh, in their culture. To use somebody's name, and usually you had um, a... Something like if I were to go, and I think I've talked about this before. Let's say I were to go, I, I was a servant for a wealthy uh, landowner. And I had been given responsibility for his accounts. And I was the one responsible for buying and selling. Go, uh, Jesus even talks about this in, in at least one of his parables. But when I would have... Transaction. It wasn't me doing the transaction. I was the representative of the whole estate. And it would be the name of the person I worked for that brought the influence to, in, to impact price, to impact availability, to impact how people saw what would take place. To know the authority behind me. I'm nothing but a servant. The authority behind me is in the name of the one that I serve. And oftentimes, a servant who would function for... Um, for the landowner or the wealthy person would have a ring with their, with their insignia on it. And that stamp worked the same as, as for that landowner. The same authority went with it. Why? Because of the name that was represented by it. 
And the same thing here is when Peter is talking to them uh, and talks about it is forgiveness through his name is referring right back to what he's just told them. His name carries with it the authority over life and death because he was raised from the dead. You see how significant it is? He's saying it's not just the name Jesus. Woo! I'll go get a cross and hang it on my neck and write Jesus on it or something, and I'm okay. That's not how it works. It's what Jesus did on that cross. When my sins were forgiven by the shedding of his blood, but it was permanently and eternally made available to each of us because of the resurrection, when God brought him back to life. You see how significant the name of Jesus is? Because there's only one that gives life. And so he is saying to Cornelius, you don't, remember when Peter walked into the room, what did Cornelius do? He bowed down to him, tried to worship him. He said, stand up, I'm just, I'm just a man, stand up. But now he's saying, the one you need to worship, his name is Jesus. And you know why you worship him? Because he holds all power, all authority. He is the judge over the living and the dead. You need Jesus. Okay? We talk about that in our Western culture, and we go, okay, I'll think about that. That's not what was happening in this room at that time. They are all of a sudden realizing who Jesus is. I'm going to stop there for a second. Maybe we're in this room right now, and you're going, I've heard about Jesus. I believe in God but do you realize what he's done for you? He died on the cross, and the proclamation of his church is still the same. We're still called to the same purpose, to tell the good news that God conquered death, and he conquered in that our sin, that which separated us from God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you haven't, If you're like Cornelius this morning, you're here in the room wanting to hear from God, well, here's what you need to hear. His name is Jesus. He died. He rose again. He met with his disciples. He had meals with them. And then he said, go proclaim the good news. I am alive. I hold the keys to life and death. Put your faith in me. That's what we are called to do. So if you haven't done that yet today, what are you waiting for? Honestly, what are you waiting for? You're not going to get there on your own. It's not being uh, good or better than somebody else. We don't live in a comparison perspective from the point of God. I was a little bit better than Renee. And uh, (laughs) sadly, it would be the other way around. I'd be in trouble. But... uh, It is the truth that I need Jesus, not somebody else to compare to. That's where we need to get to and truly bow down before him and worship him for the life that he gives us. So if you haven't done that, there's good news there for you today. Jesus is welcoming you home if you put your faith in him. Let's continue on here. Verse 44. Even as Peter was saying this, now I want you to catch... This is, this is a major significant thing that takes place here. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Okay, we could spend a couple of weeks, if not longer, talking about the impact of this. This is a... This is the seismic shift right here. This wasn't supposed to happen from Peter's perspective. In fact, I wonder as he's proclaiming Jesus to them, what he's really expecting God to do. Now, he's already said he knows that God uh, reaches out to those who, who fear him, even from every nation. But it's still got to be pretty mind-boggling to him as to what's unfolding because the Messiah was promised for the Jewish people. He knew what Jesus had done for them, but he didn't see how God was branching that out. And if it were up to Peter, it wouldn't have happened. Part of the reason the vision came to him. But I appreciate is Peter's there because of his obedience. 
He has a heart that's moldable and teachable, and his faith is being grown in this point. We need to recognize this. You never reach a point where you know everything and your faith is, now I've, I've reached the pinnacle of faith. I'm there. God, you can take me home. We should be growing every day, every moment, learning with every opportunity, how does Jesus impact and make a change in this situation? And so let me just, let's just break this down for a minute. It says there, as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. What does that tell us took place in that room with Cornelius and his family? Did they stand up and pray a prayer of confession and make sure they worded it just right so that God was pleased enough to say, okay, you can have my spirit? No. See, sometimes we make a process more important than the end result. And there's times when that might be good, but when it comes to faith, and we're seeing it right here, they put their faith in Jesus. That's what we're being told. They believed what they were hearing, and they were in their heart with God. I need Jesus. And what did they do? receive? His spirit. That's the proof right there. Now, part of this is to draw us back, and as we are told here, Verse 46, for they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. What is that supposed to take us back to? Acts chapter 2. What was the proof? Well, first, I'll even go back a little bit further. What did Jesus say was going to happen to his disciples while they waited for him in Jerusalem? That his spirit would come upon them. And then as a result, they would go out and change the world. And that happened, Acts chapter 2. And it changed the world beginning right there. It started a, a catalytic a, 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 a event. And that was the proof of God's spirit being in his people. Right here in these verses, Peter and those other Jews that are with him are seeing that God is in, Jesus' spirit is in Gentiles now. How can that be? Gentiles are unclean. Go back to the vision of Peter. He would not accept that he could act towards, you know, I can't eat those things. But it was infecting not just the food he ate, but the way he saw everything. He saw it through the lens of the law, clean and unclean. God's saying, no, I want you to think, Peter. Don't claim something's unclean that I have made clean. And now he takes him to Cornelius. And standing in the house of an unclean Gentile, the Spirit of God chooses to be there. And if God is there... I think Peter can say, I can be there too. And the whole system is now changing. And the good thing is, it was interesting, and small little caveat, and a few of his uh, companions came with him. And as Jews standing there in the house of a Gentile, my guess is when Peter went in, they were probably going, Peter, what are you doing? We can't go in there? Yeah, we can. God said we can go in. But we're breaking the law. It's okay. We're going to see what God wants to do today. And what God did was put his spirit into the lives of those who put their faith in Jesus. That's all they needed. They needed to know who Jesus was. Not the broader testimony, but the more specific victory of Jesus. He brought life to those who put their faith in him through the forgiveness of sins. And those people believed it, and God's spirit went into them. And I can tell you, it says that Peter stayed, and we're going to get to this in a minute, for several days with them. I bet he did, and I bet there were some pretty fascinating conversations as Peter was trying to figure out, God, what exactly are you doing here? My guess is Peter had some prayers with God for a while, and God, I'm, this is awesome. You're in control. I don't get it. What are we going to do? This is going to mess everything up. We already have enough problems as it is. But he acted in obedience, and Jesus changed the lives of the Gentiles in that room. And I, it's just, it's a beautiful picture. It really is. It's amazing. Now, pick up in verse 47. Then Peter asked, this is a great statement, can anyone object to their, being, uh, to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and afterwards Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Okay, that question, can anyone object do you think Peter was looking for an objection? Was that the intent of his question? I need somebody to object here. We've got to put an end to this. 
No. He, it's a statement of awe and being overwhelmed by the activity of God. How can we question this? I had questions coming in. I had questions when God was showing me that vision. I don't understand it, but I've got to tell you what, I've seen the proof God is here, and he's doing exactly for them what he did for us. Who am I to question Jesus? Who am I to question Jesus? It's a great question. Who can object? And they received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, part of the reason that Luke includes that for us, the fact that they were baptized, was because that means, and this is what causes a little bit of a challenge, we're going to see in the next thing, is that Peter not only uh, had taken the good news of Jesus to them, but he had, in being baptized in that day, was a little bit different even than we tend to treat it today. It was an expression that not only, as, as Paul states out for us in Romans, we're dying to ourselves and rising in Christ, but it was also a point of identification. That's why he says they were baptized in the name of Jesus. They now belonged to Jesus. And what does that mean? Who was Jesus in that day? It was the church, right? The church was what at this point? All Jewish. He just said Gentiles are now part of Jesus, the church. There's going to be some explaining to do. And we see there is some explaining to do and that there's some hearts that need to be changed and minds that need to be opened and faith that needs to be stretched. That's what's beautiful about this passage. God had something in mind that Peter and the others couldn't even consider. And so in a gentle way, he gives him some insight through a vision and it's, I love the faith of Peter. He's willing to obey even when he doesn't fully understand. He walks obediently. That's what God is doing. So we see this pattern again. The miracles set up what God's doing. There's something new coming. God speaks through Peter and to Peter and then through Peter. And as a, par, as a result, Jesus' uh, movement continues to impact lives, but now outside of the Jewish community. And we have the beginning of the expansion of the church into the uttermost parts of the world. It's pretty cool. God is at work. So what do we do with this at a point of application? Well, I go back to the first things that we talked about with Cornelius. Live life with an expectancy. And expect that uh, God will reward those who seek him and that he uses other people in our lives. We see that right there. I would say also we have a great lesson here in the, in the aspect of having a faith that is teachable, have a faith that is stretchable. We need to have a faith that can be expanded. Of course, we always ground it in Scripture. We, we find the truth, but we can't let our pursuit of truth to harden us into a that our faith can, just doesn't allow us to learn from God. Because if we're unwilling to grow in our faith then we will not be available as instruments for change for God in his kingdom. You can wrestle with that one a little bit this week. I also think if um, we need to trust God in that to expand our faith. If God is constantly speaking, and if Jesus is still working with the same purpose to expand his church, then where do I fit in at that? I think we should be wrestling with those questions. And what stands in the way of my being used by God to expand the church of Jesus in this world today? And then maybe I need to turn it around. Who do I see that, or maybe, how do I want to put that? Who do I look at in my life that I don't think the good news of Jesus is ever going to touch them? And I'm not sure I want it to. And anybody you don't want Jesus to reach? And then it's probably the person that Jesus wants to use you to reach. Be willing to be used in the Gentiles in your life. And I use that in a very generic form. Those that we don't see as worthy of the salvation that comes through Jesus. God is at work and wants to continue to expand his church. And then I would say, ask maybe the question of, um, who does God want to use in your life to help expand your faith? At the beginning of this uh, series in the book of Acts, I encouraged you, so I'm going to bring it back up here, to find a spiritual partner. The reason for that is what we're looking at right here. 
we cannot grow deeper and broader in our faith if we're doing it alone. I'll just simply put it that way. We need impact of God's voice through other people. There is wisdom in many counselors. We need to be those who are at process of listening to God Sunday morning, in my Bible, in my quiet time, praying to God. But God will speak through sometimes just the actions of other people. He draws our attention to things we've overlooked. Areas of our lives where we're going, ah, that's not important. And he's saying, yeah, it is. Do you expect God to still speak? But are you allowing others? And maybe who is it? Start looking. Where, who do I allow to speak into my life? Find a spiritual partner. Somebody to walk alongside you. Find many. You don't have to do it just one. But I encourage you to find at least one spiritual partner and be consistent in that. Spiritual health is found there. And then maybe one last thought we can add in this, and I think I see, we see it in such a positive with Peter, is are you asking God where he wants to uh, stretch your faith? Now, I will tell you this. It's sometimes a dangerous question to ask. But start asking, God, what don't I know about you that is holding me back from fully be, uh, embracing your truth in my life? I believe Jesus is the uh, Lord over the living and the dead, but is it changing everything in my life? Ask him. Make that part of your conversation this week. Because God's still speaking and he still has the same purpose, so maybe we need to listen and maybe sometimes the first part of listening is just to ask, God, I want to have a learner's attitude, so I'm asking you, where am I not listening to you? Where do you want to stretch me? And then just listen. Trust me, things will happen, but ask. Isn't this a great passage? Exciting to see. God's expanding his church. Great things are coming. And those of us as Gentiles can rejoice in the fact that God loves all people. And he brought the good news for all. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to come before you. It's in your name that we come before the throne of grace. We recognize what you have done for us. You are the God of the living and the dead. And we recognize that. And we want to say thank you. Lord, help us to be people who have a, a desire to continue to grow in our faith. Our faith does not stop when we find ourselves at the foot of the cross. In fact, it's a starting point. So help us to grow and be expanded. Lord, to your spirit, may we be challenged. Help us to learn. Lord, help us to find others where we can hear your voice in the encouragement we find from others and that we're listening for your voice. And Lord, I thank you for the example of a Cornelius who sought you because it shows me that you are God who always responds. Help us to be moldable. Help us to be people that desire to grow in our faith. Help us to be people who long to hear your voice. And Jesus, help us to be your body on this earth. It seems fitting as we pray that that we're going to take communion together today. And communion is where we recognize what Jesus has done. He commanded us to do this regularly, that we remember what we have received. And so that's what we will do today. We will take a cup of juice and a, and a small piece of a cracker, and we will be in those simple little elements, be reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus for what? The forgiveness of sins. We have been made whole in Jesus. And we're not to forget it. It's the reminder, even in this, do this in remembrance of me. Do what? Just the taking of the elements or to live out the elements. The living out of what we've received in Jesus. And we're being encouraged in that truth even today. So I invite you to the table if you've put your faith in Jesus. And if you're still wondering about that, I encourage you to have the faith of Cornelius. Listen to what Jesus has done for you and receive him. His blood has brought you forgiveness. His obedience brings you home. And I invite you to the table to celebrate the life you have in Jesus. Jesus, we do thank you for what is represented here in these elements. Your obedience, your sacrifice, our life. 
we give you praise. And in your name, we pray. Amen.